So living on the edge of, on the edge, Cheshire Castles in context. Um, just before I proceed from this uh, slide, just to point out here if I can, the corner here of a mot. I've been look, concentrating today on sub-rectangular baileys, unusual shaped baileys, and this one is of Doddleston Chesh Ch Castle in West Cheshire, which I'll come on to. So the medieval county... Have I got a mouse over? Okay, thank you. <laughs> Thank you. The medieval county of Cheshire, northwest England, was important strategically as a compact lordship along the northern part of the Welsh border. Seen here, we've got Wales here, the rest of England, and uh, the county of Cheshire highlighted there. Now, Cheshire's late. Cheshire's late 11th century borders were considerably more extensive than they are today. Now, please don't worry about the detail of this at the moment. I'll be coming on to some of it later, but um, this really at the moment is to highlight the fact that it's an important fact that um, Cheshire in the 11th century also included current areas of North East Wales, which is here, now considered part of Wales and not Cheshire, and Greater Manchester in the east, which is off this map. Now this is important. My interdisciplinary castles and contextual landscape studies focus for the first time on the whole county rather than the restrictive and incorrect later 13th century boundaries used by my predecessors. Therefore this paper provides a newly interpreted and revised framework of Anglo-Welsh social and political relations as an original contribution to castle studies now, looking at the whole of Cheshire for the first time, my research highlights two distinctive forms of uh, castle earthworks peculiar to this West Cheshire, the Anglo-Welsh edge of the medieval county area. So, mots with sub-rectangular or rectilinear baileys and small mots with no evidence of baileys. We'll come on to these later. These were all notably situated in an area I term the Irish Sea Cultural Zone, titled of the slides there, again more on that later, probably because the castle earthworks represent continuity of form from prehistoric Roman or Anglo-Saxon monuments to Anglo-Norman castles. Now this continuity is reflected in continuing purpose in controlling communications to the county's capital at Chester, capital there, at one time a significant Roman fortress. This in turn, I believe, indicates the continuing significance of military and social influences on the sighting of castles on the western edge of Cheshire on the northern Anglo-Welsh border. So let's have a look at the theory of this castle form, the distinctive castle form, two forms and reuse of monuments more closely and I'll start to explain this slide better. Now, what I term the Irish Sea Cultural Zone focuses on the River Dee drainage basin. Now, I've got Chester here, and this is the River Dee drainage basin either side. Now, this is on the western edge of Cheshire. By taking the whole of the late 11th century Cheshire as context, it is evident that castles on the western edge of the county form parallel defensive for, uh, chains of fortifications either side of the watershed of the River Dee and so occupied the whole of the River Dee basin. So these symbols all represent castles. Um, I won't be going into those in detail, but I'll be highlighting some of them in a moment. But they all occupy the River Dee basin. Also on the western edge of the like, of western edge of Cheshire lie three, uh, three parallel pre-Norman earthwork dikes which mark the western boundary area of the Irish Sea cultural zone. And this is Watts Dyke here in green, Offers Dyke here in blue, and Whitford Dyke here in yellow. Watts Dyke is early 9th century, believed to be, and that's closest to the D. Whitford, as I say, is yellow, and Offers Dyke, believed to be late 8th century, and that's furthest from the D. 
The positions of the dikes certainly appear to have had a direct impact on the sighting of the Anglo-Norman castles within this area, as we will see. Now, Cheshire also possessed a long-serving internal, central internal boundary, which I argue <coughs> represented the eastern boundary of the Irish Sea cultural zone. Now, from the Iron Age period, the Welsh named River Gowy, which is here, it's highlighted there, that means boundary. Gowy means boundary and was defended by the hill forts of the hill range called Mid Cheshire Ridge. And these are indicated by the shaded areas here. So we've got a ridge of hills here. Now, the previous name for Gowy was the Old Welsh Turvin, or Tarvin in modern um, English, meaning a boundary. The River Gowy, therefore, could well have been the eastern boundary of both the Iron Age Canovii tribe boundary of the subsequent Ro Roman Partilegionis of Chester's Fortress, and from the 7th century, the eastern extent of Welsh powers, with Chester centred within its territory. So, Tarvin to the east of Cheshire, here, um, what I suggest was a significant boundary name from at least the 8th century, and could be linked both geographically and politically to Maesven. Welsh Maesfen, meaning field at the boundary, positioned 26 kilometres or thereabouts immediately south of the River Gowy and Tarvin. So this notional or perhaps actual Gowy Tarvin Maesfen line here could well have extended up to the River Mersey, also meaning a boundary, boundary named the River of the Boundary, um, and could well have uh, mirrored um, the boundary line of the dikes to the west of the Irish Sea cultural zone, so the two marrying each other, um, and with Chester very firmly in the centre. And the hill forts of both the Clwydian range, which are here, shaded area here, and the hill forts of the Mid Cheshire Ridge here, very much hugging these boundary place names with Chester firmly in the centre. So Chester was uh, the county's chief town and was central to the River Dee cultural zone. Centrally too was the now extant, now non-extant, sorry, um, port of Mel's just visible here. So that no longer exists, but we've got a notional potential line of a Roman road um, leading up towards Mel's there. Now the relatively high numbers of exotic finds from Mel's might represent trading connections with the Irish Sea regions. We've got the Irish Sea here, and the Mediterranean as well during the Iron Age. Given the date range of artefacts at Mells, it may well be that the later road to Mells from Chester originally dates to the later prehistoric period and was thus contemporary with the first millennium BC hilltop enclosures I've described along the two ranges there, watching over it from west and east. So some Iron Age and Romano British enclosures, in particular sub-rectangular enclosures, and some Roman and early medieval watchtowers were possibly reused for Anglo-Norman castle baileys. Therefore, Anglo-Norman castles in the Irish Sea Cultural Zone may well have been directly influenced by the sighting of pre-Anglo-Norman watchtowers and rectilinear enclosures, all on or to the east of the dikes. So all positioned here, as you can see, there. Indeed, the relationship between the earthwork dikes and the castles on the edge of the West Cheshire has not been noted previously. Evidence of rectilinear enclosures is widespread in Britain, particularly in parts of the Welsh marches and the West and East Midlands. They are usually associated with the importance of the household group in the late Iron Age Romano-British periods. Although a number of later Iron Age rectilinear enclosures have been identified as part of a research project in the neighbouring county of Shropshire, none of the rectilinear enclosures with, within Cheshire and North East Wales have been excavated or dated. Eleven rectilinear enclosures within Cheshire and North East Wales um, have, have been uh, identified as crop marks, however, and their form and sighting appear to correspond broadly with the, those noted for the medieval county of Montgomeryshire. That is, the rectilinear enclosures were situated near to Roman forts, and this is an important observation. 
Although preservation issues have to be taken into account, notably only two of the identified 11 rectilinear enclosures are located in West Cheshire. And to, ex to explain this, it is important to note the proximity of the Mott and sub-rectangular Bailey castles to the Roman fortress of Cheshire, and these are highlighted in blue there. So these are the rect uh, Mott and sub-rectangular Bailey castles close to the fortress of Chester here and to a number of Roman roads in the River Dee cultural zone, which you can see on the slide there. It may well be that the rectangular baileys overlie or made use of pre-existing rectilinear enclosures occupied in these landscapes in the later Iron Age and Romana British periods. The rectilinear enclosures were simply obscured by later occupation in the early medieval period, when perhaps the enclosures were modified and reused as modern, ba uh, modern rectangular or rectilinear bailey castles. This would suggest that there was some periodic reuse of the same rectilinear enclosures throughout the first millennium AD. Now we know that prehistoric earthwork enclosures and stone-built Roman forts were reused in the military context for defended settlements and fortifications of Burrs during the Anglo-Saxon period. And it has been suggested that certain rectilinear earthworks in Wales should be seen as royal centres of the early medieval period, which mimicked Burrs in Mercia. It has been noted that straight-sided enclosures are, were, are all located in Wales, not Cheshire, and to the west of the medieval county of Cheshire. But what does not appear to have been considered is the possibility that rectilinear enclosures also existed within medieval Cheshire and more specifically, predominantly on or to the east of the Mercian Dykes in the River Dee cultural zone, as this map possibly indicates. The subsequent reuse of rectilinear earthworks on the Anglo-Welsh border might have skewed the formal identification of an original rectilinear enclosure and in turn resulted in the skewed distribution pattern of rectilinear enclosures as being concentrated to the west of the Dykes in Wales. What is particularly significant, however, is the majority of rectilinear enclosures were in fact situated very close to the Anglo Road board, as we can see, and this distribution strengthens the argument, I believe, for a particular social and political influence and cultural influence on the type of monument built and reused within the Irish Sea cultural zone on the western edge of Cheshire. The majority of castles in the Irish Sea cult isn't that cultural head? Um, our mots with rectilinear irregular shaped baileys numbering 12 as we can see um, in blue and mots without baileys numbering 9 ringed in red here. In addition it is notable that the majority 10 of the 12 of the definite possible and possible mots with rectilinear baileys are located to the west of the river D. Likewise the majority 7, seven out of 9 of the definite and possible mots without baileys are located to the west of the River Dee. Therefore, the significant concentration of these fort like castles to the east of the Mersin Dykes and to the west of the River Dee point to the continuity of reuse of monuments in this concentrated cross-cultural zone. The monuments may have served as forts to both strengthen the lines of the dykes to the immediate west, as well as to line and protect river iron and still functional Roman road trade routes to and from Cheshire and the Irish Sea region. Based on wider contextual landscape and place name evidence, some of the sites discussed here, such as the mots with rectilinear baileys and mots without baileys, may well have origins from the Iron Age and Romana British periods. And this is suggested that because of the ten castles with definite rectilinear baileys, those in blue, four of them are positioned on hills. And just very quickly, I'll take you through to a couple of those using LIDAR images, stripping the... Uh, the uh, the landscape of trees to see this Mott Mott Bold, Bold, Mold Bailey Hill with the two rectilinear baileys there, and also um, we also have two uh, castles on promontories. The first being Erthig Castle and Wrexham, again in the same River Dee cultural zone area, with the Mott here. This unusual shaped bailey here on a promontory at um, confluence of two rivers. Um, and interestingly, Watts Dyke incorporated into the earthworks, or the earthworks incorporated into Watts Dyke, or both. 
and the other promontory being that of Old Castle, very much um, reminiscent of um, an Iron Age fort, with Mart unfortunately not visible within what is actually a uh, sub-rectangular bailey here. Notice the number of ditches suggestive of a previous earthwork there. So hills and promontories are typical locations for Iron Age fortifications which may have been used in the early medieval period. The rectilinear castle baileys are not uniform in form, but what is a common feature of their baileys is their shared idiosyncrasic morphology in their reuse as Norman castles. So just skip that this very quickly. This one is uh, a mot without a bailey overlooking the Watts Dyke and the river there. And to conclude, to summarise, based solely on the little known history and archaeology of the Anglo-Welsh border, there cannot be any real certainty regarding the procreation of pre-Anglo-Norman power centres in this period. However, as I hope this paper has demonstrated, the form and placing of castles in the landscape in this area are clearly distinctive. The River Dee cultural zone was to protect the general movement of trade to and from Chester and onto the Irish Sea region. The Mercian dikes represented linear boundaries built at different periods within the fluctuating western boundary zone, the zone framed to the east and west by north to south hill forts. Pre-Anglo-Norman monuments and their subsequent reuse therefore provided a static chain of points of defence and surveillance to the east of the dike spheres of influence. So I propose that continuity and informing society of prehistoric, Roman and Mercian monuments to Anglo-Norman castles reflects some continuity of purpose in control over communications, movement and trade, and thus reflected the military and social significance of the castle locations. And further work, I hope, will establish whether this is a particular phenomenon just for Cheshire or further down the Anglo-Welsh border, and indeed elsewhere. Thank you.